Moving on, we will have the last panel session before the next coffee break on people power, the importance and value of workforce diversity, hosted by Peter Sargent, CEO of Community Business. As we welcome P Peter and the speakers up to the stage, please respond to the audience poll that will pop up on your devices about now. It is poll 1.14. 1.14. I guess we're waiting for the poll to come up here. I guess we'll just get started and as the poll comes up, we can stop and comment on that. So listen, thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you for those who are online. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be at Rethink Hong Kong. Thank you to K11 for hosting us. And thank you for K11 for, for, to, to, for Rethink Hong Kong for actually giving us this panel um, in an audience full of change makers. It's an absolute delight to be here talking about people, um, which are the engines of our future and our development. And so without any further ado, I'm going to quickly introduce my panel. I'm not going to go into their bios. You have that on the app, and I think there's a lot of detail there. But I'm absolutely delighted to be joined on the stage by, by three of my friends, who I know are not only very successful in their own careers, but are very successful in leading diversity and inclusion agendas within their company. And so I'd start, like to start this discussion by just asking them the very simple question. Or uh, Before we do that, the, the, uh, the, the panel has just come up. So what have we got? We've got culture, gender, race and ethnicity, LGBT, all kind of jockeying for positions. So there's a nice cross-sectionality there um, of, of different areas of focus, but certainly culture being one of the highest, which, of course, I would expect in somewhere like Hong Kong. And um, can I just have a show of hands um, within the audience of anybody that is involved within their organization in some kind of diversity and inclusion initiative or project. Okay, so probably less than 50%. Um, well, let, let's tell you a bit about our journey um, and, and um, hopefully it'll inspire you guys to get involved in something within your organization. So I'm gonna start from this end with Olivia from Swire who runs a team of five people at Swire, four people at Swire who look across uh, the, the organization at diversity and inclusion. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got started on your diversity and inclusion journey, Olivia. Great, so um, the DNI team actually in the SWI group started only uh, two years ago in 2018. Uh, so I am actually really privileged. I feel very privileged to actually uh, able to give in a role that I can dedicate 100% of my time just looking at DNI. I come from a very commercial background, um, and then I got moved into HR teams, and um, and I actually started the SWI Women's Network in the SWI group, and also sit on the first gender diversity committee. And I think um, we did that for maybe about three, four years, and I think we got to a point where we realized that as an organization, if we really want to do, want to be serious about promoting inclusion in a very diverse organization, we're going to need to dedicate some time and some resources. So um, I started with a uh, one person, and then now that in two years, I have, including myself, they're a team of four. So I like to think that we've expanded exponentially, I suppose, uh, during turbulent times like this, I think we're very lucky. Brilliant, thank you. And, and, and I, I would agree, in turbulence times, it's really quite interesting to look at this because um, it, it's quite likely that companies will lose their diverse talent as they shrink as quickly as they tried to hire it in previous years. So I think a lot of work's got into that. And if people don't look to their laurels, that could become um, a casualty of, of the COVID environment. And uh, Demon, if I can ask you, and Procter & Gamble, tell me a little bit about your journey. I think you had a very fascinating journey and it's some, somewhat different uh, to other people. Yes, indeed. Um, I'd like to start with the overall PNG framework first. Mm -hmm. I think um, probably many of us will agree that the world now we are living in is very complex and kind of confused and divided. And that pushed everyone to think about um, 
what do we do as a company um, for the society today and to generations to come? And that create a concept within Procter & Gamble we call the um, corporate citizenship. Mm -hmm. So within the citizenship framework, there are three pillars. The first one is um, environmental sustainability. That's just that we think um, about. The second pillar is about the equality and inclusion. And the final pillar is community impacts. And as you can see, all these three pillars, they are intercorrelated. And this is how we seek um, citizenship as a whole and how we see um, equality and inclusion being part of this citizenship. And back in Hong Kong, um, we started the journey like a few years ago. Actually, Port & Gamble started the journey like 30 years ago, and we kind of started quite late. Um, the Greater China had a team called the Gable um, Affinity Team, being um, gay, bisexual, um, lesbian, ally employees. So this is how we, we started. And then um, some of the colleagues in Hong Kong organization, basically they, they asked me to be the spot for Hong Kong and I am happily accepted like three years ago. At that time, we didn't do much. We just like distributing stickers and then marking the airline's name. And then I remember probably almost um, two years ago, I still remember my boss, um, our senior vice president, he's, he's here today as well. Um, he stand on the stage and talk about how important equality and inclusion is. So it's more like a shout from the leadership team. And I sit in below and I feel like, okay, being the spot, I didn't do enough. Um, distributing sticker definitely is not a good job. So we, we go back. And basically I volunteer myself. I, my background is a bit interesting to many of you. Um, I'm a sales leader in the organization. So I'm not a HR specialist. I'm not a DNI specialist for sure. I'm leading the sales function, but I'm really passionate. I, and I, I go to the management team and say, could I, could I start? Could I do something different? And they say, go ahead. So I started by understanding the, the landscape um, in the company and then doing some survey, doing some design thinking workshop, and I structured the action plan and I put the resources that I did externally and internally. My team like, got more than 20 people and none of them are dedicated resources. Basically, they are all um, our marketing manager, sales manager. And that's how we started two years ago. Um, we have some great results in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And this year, we basically pushed ourselves further. Last year, we focused on uh, mainly LGBT+. And this year, we expand the whole equality inclusion um, under four pillars, employees, brands, business partners, and community. And of course, the topics that you, that you voted. So this is how we started. And where are we now at this moment? Fantastic, thank you. What, what, what I loved about that story is you started out with one of the more difficult diversity and inclusion discussions, and you brought that to the surface and then sort of used your experience in that to then look much more broadly across the organization and its challenges. And I, I think that's, that, that's an interesting, really interesting story, particularly as you were heading up sales as, as well at the time. So it's, it's, it, you kind of had this, this double, double job. And Rachel, I think you can speak to that a little bit too, because I mean, you, 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 you have a full-time job as a practicing lawyer, yet, um, you're also leading the charge on diversity and inclusion. That's right. Um, I'm definitely not a diversity and inclusion professional. I'm actually a lawyer. Um, I'm a partner in an international law firm. And personally, I'm very passionate about DNI. And that's how we started our DNI journey. So whilst London headquarters, other international offices have um, been way ahead of the game, in the Hong Kong office with 80 people, um, no one was taking the lead on diversity and inclusion. So for my part, as a Chinese female in a leadership role in a sector which is dominated by men, um, I'm passionate about gender equality. I'm a full-time working mum, and my daughter is autistic, so I'm passionate about family diversity and about disability and different abilities. So it really was um, started you know, with me, and then with a few other people, just talking to my colleagues to see who else was passionate about this, who else wanted to do more, wanted to raise awareness, and before you knew it, um, I had two or three other colleagues who wanted to take the lead on LGBT inclusion, on um, culture, on family, etc. So that to me, the three of us was a committee. 
and um, we uh, drew on you know sponsorship from um, senior leadership, etc., to find budget um, to, to work with. Uh, we, we worked with other um, partners, other businesses, our clients, etc., to just really kickstart our DNI journey, and, and we can talk about all the different things that we did later. <laughs> I think that's, that's brilliant. I, I love that you touched on clients because when we think about diversity and inclusion, we quite often think about our own organization. And, 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 and regardless of what organization we're in, we're not a homogenous group. We're not, we're not all the same brand and the same label, although we're representatives of that brand. But it's also important how our clients see us. And I think um, increasingly people are using their wallet to buy in a certain way, depending on what a certain organization represents. Um, so I came to this, this, this situation through moving to Hong Kong back in 97. Um, I was an out open gay man in London. I went straight back into the closet in Hong Kong because I would not have got the job otherwise. And many, many years later, Charlene Matani, who's the founder of Community Business, where I now work, challenged me. She said, you know, one day, you know, you're the most angry, indignant person about what's not happening. And so who do you expect to fix this? And so sooner or later, I got kind of dragged kicking and screaming into the diversity world um, and actually became an ag advocate for not just diversity and inclusion, but human rights in general. Um, and I think, Rachel, you and I first met on, on a discussion around human rights and anti-slavery, which one of your early speakers, um, uh, Matt Freeman, is very much involved in with the Mekong Club. So, I mean, I think however we come to this discussion, we all become advocates for a, a diverse, broad spectrum of diversity and inclusion issues. And, you know, the ones that we put up on the, on the screen to start with were just a, a, a small glimpse of those. Um, I would argue that in Hong Kong, there's, there's massive diversity even within the, the Chinese community, and, and, and we ignore that uh, at our detriment. Um, so, so just to take this conversation a little further, I'd like to ask um, about sort of tips you'd have for somebody else that's starting out. And if you don't mind, I'll go the same way again, um, starting with Olivia. Some, somebody starting new to this, where they, where they don't necessarily have anything in their company. Where, where on earth would you start? So, I mean, I think that, I mean, as I'm listening to Denman and also Rachel, I, I think there's a common theme here. I mean, the first thing is that you need to have people that are extremely passionate. It is one of those things that where it's a two step forward, one step back, and it frustrates the heck out of you. And so if you don't have the passion and that you don't really care about diversity and inclusion, then you might as well don't get involved with it because it's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. So I think having said that, I think also it's really important to have really senior leaders um, support. And I was very fortunate, I think from a small perspective, our chairman is extremely supportive. And so this is one of the reasons why the DNI role was created is because the chairman himself, um, you know, really cares about diversity and inclusion and being a conglomerate that Swire is that, you know, by nature, our people are diverse. And so therefore, the, at the end of the day, diversity is really a fact for us, whereas inclusion is a choice. And this is where that we can actually make the difference. Um, the way that we started was that I really started with a blank sheet of paper, which is the great part of it. So we started with nothing. And within six, nine months, we created a strategy. And in that strategy, we listed our goals, what we want to achieve in the next five years. And we listed the diversity focus area that we want to work on. So all the areas that you saw covered there, pretty much are the areas that we decided that we wanted to cover. And because we think that's important. Um, at the end of the day, is diversity is not on a single spectrum. It's not just about gender or LGBT or people with disability. And in many ways, it's an intersectionality of all these areas, because as human, we are very complex. And so I think that's one of the ways. So then you need to identify. So we identify our focus area, but also Swire is a conglomerate. So we have aviation, properties, fast moving consumer goods. And I think one of the things that for any organizations that looking at starting um, diversity and inclusion within, the, or, you know, within um, your companies or in an industry, in your market that you're in, you have to understand your market in the, in the industry you're in, in terms of respecting what is important for them. So, you know, we have in Cathay, we have a gender and a pride network uh, because Cathay is very much, I mean, the colleagues are out and proud and that's great. But then if you look at a company in terms of in um, Swai Coca-Cola, they want to look at gender and then, you know, they want to look at uh, people with disability. But then in Taiwan, they want to look at pride as well because, you know, marriage equality, um, it's just the law is passed, just passed last year. So I think that one of the things that in terms of starting these areas that you have to kind of look at the goals you want to achieve, give yourself some timelines, set accountability, look at your focus area, 
and then respect the organizations and the and the markets and the geography they're in in terms of what needs to come first. Yeah, I think that's important. You know, not not all of these priorities will be your priorities, and and you've kind of got to meet the people within the companies where they're at and and start the conversation. Um, Demon, Demon, would you like to share a little bit about any tips you'd have starting out? Okay, um, I think when we start the in I journey, I will think for the who, what, and how. So for the who part, probably like, like the learning objective, like who is responsible for, for DNI. And I think it comes from both top and also from the bottom. So basically, I think there are lots of leaders um, in this room. So I think as a leader, we need to um, cultivate a face, um, culture of diversity and inclusion first. I think that's is important. And with the culture or expectation set by the management team or the organization culture, and I will echo Livia, we need passionate people from the bottom to, to get together and then to think through the plan and action. So who being responsible, I think everyone in organization, important for top management to set this patient culture, important to find a group of passionate people from the working level to, to get together and, and get the things done. So this is um, the cool part. From the what part, um, it is really important to understand the, I would call it diversity and inclusion landscapes of your company. Um, we got a list of um, area that we love to focus, but when you just start the journey, you cannot, you can't um, do it all, very difficult. So you really need to understand where you want to laser focus at the very beginning. Um, like different market have different priority and definitely um, different functions may have different priority. And in our case, actually um, we started um, by understanding the employees list. Um, we have a LGBT plus survey globally and basically we adapted it in the Hong Kong, Taiwan. A list of questions um, asking people how they feel about the diversity and inclusion in the LGBT plus um, area within our organization. And actually, that is really an awakening call for me. It's, it really slapped me. Um, like two years ago, I feel like we, we, we're doing a good job in LGBT companies talking about that. I feel like we are inclusive, but employee didn't see it that way. They feel like, okay, there's no physical support from the leadership team. There's no physical support from the company in the market of Hong Kong, Taiwan. And I know that probably that's the area we need to focus on, being visible and across um, area. So that's how we started in Hong Kong, Taiwan a year ago. Um, we got 100% of our leadership team um, being a proud ally. And they visibly tell the organization we are allies. And as a company, the first time we walked the Pride Parade in Taiwan uh, with PNG logo, PNG flag, mm -hmm. show the visible support to your organization. And we are doing the same in this weekend in Taiwan as well. And the Pink Dog, Pink Friday. So this is the second part about the what. You need to understand the landscape. Um, you need to be choiceful um, on the DNI problem you want to solve at the first place. And finally, it's the how. To start with, um, I feel really puzzled because as I share, I'm not a um, HR, HR specialist, I'm not a DNI specialist, and I do not know how to start with. So we um, really need to connect with resources internally and externally. Um, I connect um, externally to um, Interbank, um, um, financial industry, um, LGT plus um, organization. I find resources in community business, um, the LGBT plus index, and I also collect internally. Um, I download resources from other markets like the Europe, um, like the Asia. So I, I just know how, what they are doing, what is working and what is not. So I just pull out a toolkit that I, I think is um, useful for local market. So start from the who, think carefully about the, the what, and then connect with resources, and that will be your how. I think that's really, that's really interesting because particularly for SMEs, they might not have all those resources internally, but for sure they're going to be struggling to, to, to resource their organization because the next generation of talent is absolutely looking at this and, and, and will choose organizations that they just won't work for if they don't see a reflection of themselves in that organization. And it doesn't matter what area of diversity that is 
I think that's true across the board. Um, Rachel, I'm going to ask you the same question, tips for starting out, but I'd also like you to talk a little bit about the importance of allyship, if you would. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so then uh, in terms of tips for starting out, um, I think picking up on a little bit that I said before, um, leaning on your sector, your clients and your business community, if you don't have a budget, and frankly, when we started out, there was no DNI budget. Um, we collaborated a lot with even our competitors to host events together. Um, so that was something that we could do because, you know, we're a law firm, we have office space, uh, we have conferencing space. So that was something that was quite an easy win in terms of collaboration, but also being able to educate, host an event, etc. Um, we also um, collaborating with NGOs, leaning on, on NGOs and working with community business. So you mentioned um, um, the LGBT inclusion index. That actually really kick-started our um, you know, LGBT inclusion in the workplace because, frankly, our office for 80 employees four years ago, there was nobody who was out. Um, and, and that's fine. It's a, it's a personal decision, but it also suggests that it might not be a safe space to come out. And so um, working with community business, uh, with training, with educating senior leadership, but also taking part in the inclusion index was very, very valuable. Um, I mean, the, for those of you who aren't aware, just a, a little bit about the inclusion index was that, I mean, it asks you all sorts of questions and it helps you benchmark yourself um, to check how inclusive your organization really is. And it could ask you all sorts of questions from whether or not you have LGBT inclusion training um, all the way through to do you offer um, uh, medical insurance to your employee same-sex spouse? Um, where that's not recognized here in Hong Kong, but they are married in another jurisdiction. So all these types of things. And we used, we actually used that index um, and applied it to other aspects of DNI and, and asked ourselves, how do we benchmark when it comes to gender equality? Um, how do we benchmark when it comes to recognizing family and, and culture? So that was something that was very, very useful. On allyship, um, uh, it's very because i'm passionate about diversity and inclusion um when you for me i have been an active ally um for the lgbt uh, plus community um seeing my employees come out recognizing that the office is a safe space has been something that's really um kind of pushed that uh, forward um for the firm, we've done all sorts of things. I think you mentioned handing out stickers. I mean, anything that just shows your employees that you are um, uh, a safe space. So everything from colored uh, rainbow lanyards to um, an FAQ mouse pad. I mean, not many people use mouse pads now, but we, we printed all sorts of mouse pads. We had stickers, we had um, stationery. Um, and we, we had LGBT inclusion training and um, we had postcards as well. So for the postcards, um, employees were given postcards and they were able to just put this um, rainbow ally postcard at their desk, on their notice board, on their laptop, wherever. And it just showed um, the LGBT plus employees and colleagues that we're an ally. And if you want to talk to me about it, that's that's OK. So these are some of the little things that we did to just really Brilliant. proliferate that thank you thank you and, and i know you can also talk for hours about that so um and i would encourage any of you that have questions after this this forum to approach any of us outside of this one we'll be happy to help what i would like to do i've got another, another other question here about significant roadblocks and what have you but i think i'd rather spend the time on questions from the audience so if you have any questions i would encourage you to register them through the app um and you know i, I would just like to to, to, to sort of talk a little bit as well about the non-LGBT aspects of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think it was interesting looking at the poll earlier. We were quite low on those that are looking at age. And I'd, I'd say that we probably all need to look at that, particularly with next generation and how we effectively bring them into the workforce in a way that they're included um, and feel comfortable. Uh, but also, we're not really having a disability conversation within this audience. I think 4% was the number we had on the poll. And, and most people during their lifetime will experience some form of disability, whether it's visible or not. And then, of course, in the context of COVID, um, I would argue that we're all suffering a little bit from a mental health challenge. Um, and, and those that tell you that they're OK are probably not telling the complete truth. In, given that, we're all starting Zoom calls with, hi, how are you? And having a little bit more of a purposeful conversation about how we're each traveling. Um, so, so if you've got any questions, I'd, I would encourage you to, to register them. Do we have any on, on the iPad? 
Okay, let's have a look. No questions at the current time. Well, then, I, then I'll, I'll carry on with my questions. Um, and if you have any, please, please go ahead and register them. So, so um, I'm going to actually start with, with you, Denman, this time. And just tell me a little bit, if you can, about any roadblocks you've had in your career around diversity and inclusion and how you've overcome them. I feel lucky. I don't have a major roadblock, but when we first started, um, I feel like it's more about the, um, like Rachel said, it's about the environments that we love to create. When we first started this journey, I just feel like people are being very cautious, mm -hmm. um, not only being out, but, you know, about talking um, about diversity and inclusion and showing their supports to, to people around them. Um, in the survey that we did, when people um, within our organization, when they hear about some, you know, um, non-inclusive languages or like anti-LGBT plus joke, only 20% of them will stop this kind of behavior or try to, try to um, correct that. And this is just people don't feel safe to, to speak up. And, and this is the problem that um, we kind of face at the beginning of the journey. And I think the approach that we talk is quite similar. Um, physical leadership support and also all kind of, um, you know, physical like stickers and, and flags and so on. So to, to create environments that people th feel like this is safe to talk. Mm -hmm. And of course, training is important. So we have training um, to tell everyone um, what is the inclusive languages, um, what is the right approach when we, when we discuss, and what is the right behavior that, that we encourage everyone to do. So I think this is the um, kind of minor obstacle or minor roadblock that, that we kind of um, first get started. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions here, and, and there's a couple of questions on the same topic, um, so we'll ask that first. Um, and this is quite often um, related to gender equality um, and women's represent, the representation of women in the workforce, women on boards, women in senior, senior leadership positions. Um, and so the question is, uh, um, how do we feel about quotas? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that to Olivia because <laughs> we have had some conversations on this. Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> okay, so I, I ask, I, you know, we get asked this question all the time. And I always says, you know, like quota, targets, you know, you go, you call it whatever you want. At the end of the day, it's accountability. You know, I mean, for us that are in business, like, you know, Denman in sales or, you know, in ratio in the partners in a law firm, we all have to, you know, turn up some numbers. We all are given targets, uh, revenue targets, commercial targets. How is it different than actually setting a target and trying to get more representation in various level? So, you know, when people talk about, oh, you know, quota means that people that are less deserving. Well, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, it's how, how it is being put forward. I mean, the argument is that our assumption is that because we use quota, that that means that it means people are less deserving. Well, maybe, maybe we didn't, then we need to look at is that how do we actually make evaluation? Are our evaluation in terms of putting diverse people or diverse representation on you know, senior management, are they a fair evaluation? And then from there, in the end, personally, we set target. We call it targets because that's what it is called. We have a target of 30% women in senior leadership. Uh, that's basically in the C-suite minus two and above in the next five years. So we just finished year one. We are currently at 25%. So then we have another four years to go. Uh, we don't think that it should be difficult to reach 30%, but you know, yes, we, we have a target and we aim to, you know, aim to meet that. And we believe that we can, but you know, again, I, I always get, you know, get to this point is like, it's, you know, you call it whatever you want. It's just holding people accountable. Mm. So let's just, let's just be, just to say that we just need to hold people accountable to make sure we have fair representation. So targets and goals versus quota. Um, I, I, I love this question too. I mean, we, we at Community Business do the research on women on boards where we look at the Hang Seng Index 
and, and what the percentage is. And, and there's, there's some pretty awful statistics there. So, you know, this thing in Hong Kong is moving at a glacial pace. And so um, I, I spoke to Fiona Nod at the Women's Foundation and we're, and we're good friends. We've sat on these panels together over the years. And, we, and, and my question to her was, how do we at Community Business, myself in particular, become a, a, a better ally to gender equality? Uh, and, and the fact is I am, that the, the dearth of men in our family between me and I think the next man born into my mother's side of the family is currently seven years of age. So I'm surrounded by women in my life. And so why would I not be an advocate for gender equality? And we were debating whether nonprofit organizations can have a bigger voice in this space um, than, than corporates because corporates have a client base and they don't want to offend their clients and what have you. And equally, we don't want to offend people that are trying to move. And so you've got to kind of meet the, each company at, at, at its, at, in its own space and encourage movement forward rather than naming and shaming but you know I, I, I'm kind of starting to come out on the, on, on, on the side of naming and shaming just because I don't think we're seeing the change that we need at the speed we need it within the generations that we need it to happen um, and, and you know that, that's, that's a tough call but uh, you know you, you want people to get there on merit and, and, uh, and, and you know if you look at some, something like race and ethnicity and you look at the Zubin Foundation and what they do to highlight talent from an ethnicity perspective they're doing some phenomenal work and they're looking to elevate people of different ethnicities into senior roles because the talent is there. It's just a question of people knowing about it. And I think you know, that's probably the conversation we need to be having around gender equality as well, is highlighting the female talent and, 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 and how we do, do we get these people into senior positions. So, so thank you for that question. Um, there's another question here, and I've just lost the whole thing. There we go. Um, another question here about um, how do we in, avoid labeling the labeling effect uh, when promoting LGBT inclusion in your company. Um, any of you want to take that? How, how do you avoid the labeling effect when promoting LGBT inclusion in your company? I, I, I guess what this, what, this, what this is, is pointing out someone for being LGBT, requiring them to come out, and then the potential discrimination that they could face. Um, any thoughts on that? Of course. Um... I think building um, an effective ally system is important. Mm -hmm. So when you see our um, affinity group, the gay ball, it's not about LGBT, but it's like um, gay, ally, bisexual, lesbian, employee. So you don't have to come out. You, you can support um, the LGBT, whether you're LGBT plus or not. So this is how we build the ally system. Everyone can be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you do not need to be afraid of being labeled. And I think this is um, structurally um, what we can do. But I think more importantly, um, if people still are afraid of being able, that should be a you know, question that we are not doing enough. I'm creating a safe environment mm -hmm. for people to come out or to, for people that um, just um, be their self at work. So I think if people still afraid of being able, um, the other question is, um, what's when once within the organization and what mm -hmm. can we do more? But I but, think to start with an ally system mm -hmm. uh, would be a good place. And I think, you know, I mean, the, the, the gold standard is not to create a place where employees can come out. I mean, that might maybe a Western construct, but in the Asian environment, you, we've got to recognize that we're working within relatively small communities where, where your uncle's brother probably works with a friend who plays mahjong and, 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 and knows your boss. And so if somebody in this environment is to come out at work, there's a high likelihood that that's going to um, also get back to their family. So you need to be conscious of the local construct and, and, and do something that's locally appropriate. And so I think measuring whether or not people come out within your organization is not necessarily an effective measure, but measuring the support and the allyship and the community that, that helps people bring themselves to work fully, then, then that's more what we're looking for. And, and let's face it, as an ally, your voice is often heard better than the actual minority group that you're trying to represent. So I think that, that stretches across diversity and inclusion issues. There's another question here, which I really love. And I think this is very important um, in, the, in the current environment and of COVID. Um, what, what, what have we seen around um, unconscious bias and uh, particularly around denial of, of bias? Anybody like to take that? What I would say is, you know, with, with, all, with all of the stuff we pivoted to in doing consultancy and training through Zoom, I've seen a much higher proportion of senior managers, senior leaders turning up to these, these trainings and, and conferences because I think they're more conscious of the challenges their people are going through and they just want to be better people managers. Um, and there's been a lot more talk around unconscious bias. 
Um, I don't know. Any, any, any thoughts? So, I mean, I think in terms of um, bias, it's, it's one of those that where, so it's, we, we actually just finished doing a uh, DNI post survey. So within there, we have like five, D, a very quick survey, five DNI questions, five demographic questions. It's completely anonymous. It's only for the, um, the central group, the John Swan Sons group. So there's about over 500 people. We have close to 50% response. And I think what's interesting is that there was a couple of uh, things that, that came out from that. One is that there are people that are very vocal when we ask about race. Because in race, we basically use the Hong Kong um, you know, census standard in terms of listing Chinese, Japanese, Indian, and then we have white. And I have remarks coming back completely anonymous, which is fine. You are from DNI. How dare you use the word white? You know, <laughs> and so it was really fascinating. And then you know, or there will be people that are coming up to me and say, "Oh my God, this is such a tough survey. I have to go and research what is asexual, bisexual, transgender." Well, I really don't understand any of those words. And to me, that was brilliant because at the end of the day, is that whatever the response that we're getting, because we're getting them, and I think that actually give us a kind of a lead into the fact is that. We can now go and start to talk about conversation that's going to be extremely uncomfortable because, you know, conversation around race, conversations around sexual orientations, conversations around ethnic, I mean, around in terms of disabilities, whether you can see them or not, is extremely uncomfortable. We are, you know, Asian, you know, Chinese, you know, polite. We don't like to make waves. We like harmony. And I think that this is a perfect opportunity. So, you know, I think in some ways, you know, that maybe not exactly answering questions about getting people a denial of bias, but it's actually pushing people to be willing to talk about things that's extremely that, I uncomfortable. That's, I think that's really powerful. You know, we've got to be having these conversations um, and, and we've got two and a half minutes to wrap up. So I'll, I'll make sure I'll attempt to do that. Um, when we asked at the beginning how many of you are involved in diversity and inclusion initiatives in the workforce. And there was very, there's very few in the audience. I, I would have liked to have seen a, a show of hands from everybody because I would argue that diversity and inclusion is everybody's responsibility. If you're going to be an effective manager, an effective leader, an effective member of staff, or you're just going to be inclusive of the people around you, you need to be cognizant of, of all of the various forms of diversity that that individual could represent and not be expressing to you because you really don't know them that well. And the, the more sort of they, they keep to themselves aspects of themselves, then the less they're going to be effective in, in performing their role. And so I, I would argue that that's all of your responsibilities. Um, I hope through the panel, you, you come away with a few ideas of what you could do. Um, my biggest suggestion would be just to start a conversation um, with anyone in the organization. And you know what, I, I, would, I would start with next gen. I, I would start with the youngest folks in your organization because they've grown up in, in an environment where they've gone through college and university expecting business to have fixed this. And we really haven't. So you know, I, I'm, I'm confident that we'll all have jobs into the, into the long future, but you know, I'd love to put an army of supporters and advocates and allies that would help us with this. Um, so, I mean, it's good news in that we're not going to be able to have a job in, in, in the short term, but, but I still think there's mountains to climb. Um, and th those mountains are different depending on the country, depending on the company. Um, but I would say we, we shouldn't ignore things like Black Lives Matter. I mean, we've seen CEOs across the world come out with comments about that, and I don't know that's necessarily helpful. But what's helpful for us from an Asian perspective is it gives us the permission to have these conversations. Now, it's, it's going to be a different conversation around race and ethnicity. There's, cult, there's cultural overlays to that. There's cultural norms. It's, it's complex and it's different in every single country. So if I take India, for example, it's given us the opportunity to have a conversation about caste systems and what that means to people and how we can impact those things. And it gives us similar opportunities here in Hong Kong and around the region. So um, with, with that, I would say thank you very much. This is nowhere near enough time to cover such, a, just such an interesting and important topic. But it, it's about us being better people managers and better colleagues. And so I would very much encourage you all to get involved in some form of diversity and inclusion discussion within your workplace. So thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Peter and all speakers for the very captivating session.